Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to All Angels. It's great to see all of you here. And you, and you look so springy and summertimey. The colors are beautiful, so thank you. I'm glad you're here. And welcome to everybody that's on Zoom and everyone on YouTube who is watching in our country and around the globe. So welcome. Our service begins on page two in your bulletin. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed, blessed be God's, God's kingdom, kingdom, now and forever. forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. <clears throat> Holy One of Israel, you restore what is lost, heal what is wounded, and gather in those who have been rejected. Give us the faith to speak as steadfastly as did the Canaanite woman, that the outcast may be welcome and all people may be blessed by your holy name. Amen. Amen. A reading from Romans. So I ask you, has God rejected his people? Absolutely not. I'm an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. God hasn't rejected his people whom he knew in advance. Or don't you know what the scripture says in the case of Elijah, when he pleads with God against Israel? God's gifts and calling can't be taken back. Once you were disobedient to God, but now you have mercy because they were disobedient. In, in the same way, they have also been disobedient because of the mercy that you received. So now they can receive mercy too. God has locked up all people in disobedience in order to have mercy on all of them. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The psalm for this morning is Psalm 133. It can be found in your bulletin and in your prayer books on page 787. Let us read it responsively by half verse. Oh, how good and pleasant it is. When brethren live together in unity. It is like fine oil upon the head. That runs down upon the beard. Upon the beard of Aaron. That runs down upon the collar of his robe. It is like the dew of Hermon. For there the Lord has ordained the blessing. Life forevermore. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Christ. Jesus called the crowd near and said to them, listen and understand. It's not what goes into the mouth that contaminates a person in God's sight. It's what comes out of the mouth that contaminates the person. 
Then the disciples came and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended by what you just said? Jesus replied, Every plant that my father didn't plant will be pulled up. Leave the Pharisees alone. They are blind people who are guides to blind people. But if a blind person leads another blind person, they both will fall into a ditch. Then Peter spoke up, explain this riddle to us. Jesus said, don't you understand yet? Don't you know that everything that goes into the mouth, goes into the mouth, enters the stomach and goes out into the sewer? But what goes out of the mouth comes from the heart. And that's what contaminates a person in God's sight. Out of the heart come evil thoughts, murderers, adultery, sexual sins, thefts, false testimonies, and insults. These contaminate a person in God's sight. But eating without washing hands doesn't contaminate in God's sight. From there, Jesus went to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from those territories came out and shouted, Show me mercy, son of David. My daughter is suffering terribly from a demon possession. But Jesus didn't respond to her at all. His disciples came and urged him, Send her away. She keeps shouting after us. Jesus replied, I've been only sent to the lost sheep the people of Israel. But she knelt before him and said, Lord, help me. He replied, it is not good to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. She said, yes, Lord, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall off their master's table. Jesus answered, woman, you have great faith. It will be just as you wish. And right then, her daughter was healed. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord, Lord Christ. Christ. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be always acceptable to you. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Some of the hardest words that we have in the Gospel are... Uh, here today. Did Jesus uh, fall into an issue of sexism? Was Jesus playing regionalism? Racism? All of these questions have been thrown at Jesus when referring to the Canaanite woman who asked for Jesus to help and who he declined. And so I want to dig a little more deeper into this. Uh, but the, the first question that I have to ask is, what happens when God pushes back? So what, what happens when you ask God for something and God says no, or God says not yet, or God says, why would I do that? Ouch. Uh, there's a comedian, Jim Gaffigan, and he... Uh, He's Roman Catholic, and his wife had a brain tumor, and his, she successfully recovered. Uh, but his comedy has changed a bit since that experience. And one of the things that he uh, talks about in one of his most recent stand-up routines is talking about this very nature, about people that cry out to God, and then God would reply, hmm, didn't you say I didn't exist when you were in college? <laughs> I mean, what happens when God pushes back? Well, here is a story of that of a woman crying out for help to Jesus, and he said, <clears throat> why, why should I? So, the, the region of Tyre and Sidon, that's the first uh, clue to show us what's happening here. Jesus was in an area that he is not normally in. Uh, he is normally in the southern territory, the Judean territory, and he has traveled north and traveled west. So these are beautiful towns on the Mediterranean coast, and these towns are trading towns. Uh, and ever since Rome came and occupied Palestine, they have been setting up the systems of road and economic infrastructure so that that region can start to trade. And so uh, the olives that are grown in Bethlehem and the fish that are caught there are being um, traded out through these ports. 
And so there are people in that region that have become wealthy because of uh, the economic prosperity that Rome has brought them. And so on one hand, they are under the oppression of Rome. On the other hand, economically, there are some doing very, very well. And so in that disruption is Jesus. And there were, um, there's a particular theological stance from wealthy Canaanites back in those days. And I, I should say it's more than just Canaanites. Uh, there were many in the territory of Judah that believed this as well. And, and this is the theology. So the theology is that if you're wealthy, it's because God has blessed you to be wealthy. Okay? Um, now, this flies in the face of what uh, Americans think about uh, self-determination and you're wealthy because you've worked hard. Uh, in those days, they believe that you're wealthy because God blessed you or God wanted you to be wealthy. So that's step number one. Uh, theological step number two, it's related to number one. Poor people, you can fill in the rest of the sentence, poor people are poor because God has wanted them to be poor. So step one, you're wealthy because God wants you to be wealthy. Number two, people are poor because God wants those people to be poor. And then it doesn't take much out on this theological limb to go to step number three. If you're wealthy and you help somebody who's poor, you have now violated what God wanted or God's plans. Now, this might sound rough, but it, it happened back then that people thought, I'm wealthy because God has blessed me. And so imagine the wealthy young man that came to Jesus and said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, take all your wealth and give it to the poor. What? <laughs> God has given me that. He has blessed me with this. So what do you mean I have to give away my wealth to the poor? So that's where this whole mindset is coming from. Not that we have that mindset today. I'm sure we've outgrown this. Right, Reverend Maggie? <laughs> we haven't. In fact, in, uh, in England's history, so in 15th, 17th century, 16th, in that range, uh, there were uh, the idea of a pyramid. And so at the top of the pyramid is God, and then under that is Jesus, and then you have Jesus' as apostles, then his saints, and then the clergy, and then the laity down at the bottom level. And so then you turn that pyramid a bit, and you've got the king, like God, and then you've got the king's... Uh, people that do all his work, like the apostles, and then the saints, and then the subjects. So then you turn the pyramid one more time, and you have the landowner, and the serfs, and then the servants, and then the slaves, right? That uh, the idea was, if you were to disrupt this economic structure, you would be disrupting the divine right of kings, and you would be disrupting God's sovereign power over God's apostles and his church. We have, I, I was going to say we've moved away from that, but I'm, <laughs> maybe we haven't. Anyway, so that, that's the pyramid structure, and this is what's happening in Jesus' day and time. And so the Canaanite woman, who many believe is wealthy and is doing well, uh, but, so I'm wealthy, uh, and I know I'm being blessed by God because I'm wealthy, and because I'm wealthy, I've been blessed. You see this circular argument. So here I am, I'm blessed, but there's a problem. My daughter is sick, just like those poor people. So how can it be that I'm wealthy and I have a sick daughter? So she takes the next step, and that is calling upon an outsider, an Israelite, somebody from the region of Judea, a wealthy, I'm sorry, wealthy, a poor rabbi comes to town and she cries out to him. This shows you her desperation. So then it doesn't answer the question of why did Jesus not help her? Why did Jesus push back? So there are writings of the day uh, that said from wealthy people, if they were to help poor people, I'm going to step over the middle one and go to the third one. If the wealthy people were to help poor people, it would be like taking food for your children and feeding it Two dogs. Now, when you think of dogs, don't think of the pets that you have at home. Uh, don't think of those cherished and loved animals. Uh, the dogs are the ones that run throughout the streets. They're scavengers, and they, they go after rodents, and they do that stuff. They, they take care of themselves. So, why, and so don't think that Jesus is saying, as some have interpreted, 
that Jesus likes dogs over humans. And there are some that would say, my dog is better than most. Anyway, but <laughs> that's neither here nor there. That's not what he's saying. Uh, that why would you take food for children and essentially throw it away? Throw it to animals who are fending for themselves. That's what many of the wealthy Canaanite people believed about helping the poor. So when she is in this status, but then goes over here to ask for help, Jesus takes her words and says them back to her. You need help? Why would I do that? Wouldn't that be like taking food from my children and giving it to dogs? Ouch. In our confession, we talk about things that we have said it's because God, in my experience, has used our own words against us. Like when I was in Chula Vista at St. John's. I love it here. I'm never going to leave, <laughs> says God. Oh, that's funny, right? Have you experienced that, where you make God laugh by telling God your plans? So uh, these are the times that God uses our words against us. And if you start thinking about uh, the Miranda rights, God doesn't respond to Miranda rights. He will use your words against you, just as he did for this woman. And so this reminds me of a story, and it's of a pastor in the San Diego area who is on the radio. And I got to um, be at a pastor's convention where he was speaking. And with us, he talked about his own conversion. And he was born and raised a Methodist and went to Methodist youth group and all that stuff, but then he went to college. And he met uh, relativism, he met scientific thought, and he met these other things that broke apart the God of Sunday school. And so by the time he had graduated from college, he no longer believed in God, and he also discovered a fondness for surfing. And so surfing became his new religion, and he would say that. He was proselytizing surfing as a spirituality. Uh, and he would ask his friends, why are you going to church? I'm going out on the ocean. I'm gonna go out and be out there. That's where God really is, if God even exists. That's where I like to go. Why do you even bother going to church? So one day, there is a hurricane, and it is near Hawaii, which is creating a good system of waves that are hitting Southern California. Uh, but the waves have gotten so bad, because of the crossing wind, that the beaches have been closed, and the lifeguards have been pulled back into the remote stations. So all they're using are binoculars, because it is that dangerous. And that's when this guy decides, I'm going to go out and surf this. It's his religion. It's not going to let him down. So he gets his board and he starts paddling out. And he's paddling so hard against these big waves that by the time he finally gets out to where he would be, he doesn't have much energy. And he starts to think, if things go bad out here, I won't be able to paddle back in. I don't have the energy. I have to ride one of these waves in. Well, the waves are not reacting like normal waves, and every time he tries to get up on his board, it rolls him. They're coming in too quickly. And so he then holds onto his board, uses it like a boogie board, and tries going in that way, but the water comes up on the stern of the, uh, on the board and just puts him straight into the water. The third time after he goes in, he's holding on his board, and he is so tired and cold that he doesn't know if he has the energy to get back onto the board itself. There are no lifeguards, nobody knows where he is, and he realized this is it. So he cried out to God. He said, Jesus, help me, as he's holding onto his board. And as he told us, with uh, some tears gleaming in his eyes, he got a response. It was red, puffy letters in the sky, three letters, W, H, why? Lord, help me. Why? The same question he had asked his friends that were going to church. Why? So the woman, the Canaanite woman, born and raised in a particular structure, believing things about certain people, having ideology and, um, and economics around wealth and not helping others, had been moved to a state where she needed to ask Jesus for help. He 
he did, she did. Jesus pushed back. And then she humbled herself. By quoting scripture, even the dogs get crumbs that fall from their master's table. She humbled herself. So remember that pyramid? So she's wealthy landowner at the top. She just moved herself down to the position of dogs that get crumbs from the table. And Jesus looked at her and said, you have great faith. Your child as well. The surfer, as he's holding on, sees red letters. Why? And he says, because I'm not worthy, but you save people who are in trouble. And as soon as he said that out loud, another wave came up that got him onto his board. And he wrapped his arms around the board and his feet were, uh, his ankles were tucked underneath the backside and he just held on. And that wave pushed him and rolled him. And as he's being pushed and rolled, he remembers all of the times in college that he said God doesn't exist. He thought about all the ways that he was living for himself and had let go of Christian charity, Christian prudence. He was remembering as the water is rolling him and pushing him towards the shore and he landed on the beach. And with the little energy he had, he dragged his board back to his car and he drove to the nearest Methodist church. Humility. There is a way that we can connect with God when God pushes back. So in uh, when I was in seminary, I was a chaplain for um, the VA, and the VA has uh, every religion that one can imagine uh, is present and alive in the VA. There is some veteran who has that belief system. And so we pulled a bunch of us chaplains together. It's the first time I'd ever been in a place where there was a Sufi and there was a, a rabbi, and I mean, it was just, and of course, Roman Catholic, and then all the rest, Muslim, were all there. And our leader of our chaplain group said, let us pray. And the um, academic side of me said, let us pray. Oh, this is going to be interesting. <laughs> and so, uh, so she said, let us pray. Lord, we are not worthy. We're not worthy to be called to serve your people. We're not worthy to look at you. And we're not worthy to call upon your grace. But because of your goodness, you have assembled us together. Heal those in our presence and help us to be healers of your presence. Amen. By bringing all of these religions together and beginning with the prayer of, I am not worthy, by putting us, whatever we, are, wherever we might be on that pyramid, by putting us at the bottom, we're not worthy, Lord. Yet you are great and awesome. It's the thing that pulls all religions in together. It's this part that unites us. And so the good news is, if you have had a time in your life, or maybe that time is now, where you have asked for God for something and God has pushed back, where you have asked for God and are praying about something and God has said no, or maybe not yet, or maybe God sounds like he's not even listening. The good news, like the Canaanite woman, we have the ability with humility to say to God, I'm not worthy, but you are. And when we do that, God hears, God heals, God restores. Never in the imagination of those of the Judaic faith or those of the Christian faith, we never thought we would find our connection to God through a Canaanite woman. But through the mercy of God and through his humility, we can follow her example and find a connection with God. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit.
Turning in your bulletin to page three, I invite you to stand as you're able. And together, let us say the words of our faith found in the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is in and unseen. We believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with God through whom all things were made. For us and for our salvation, God came down from heaven by the power of the Holy Spirit and became incarnate in the Virgin Mary and was made human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God. He will come again in glory to judge the living. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who saves from the cross. Catholic and Apostolic Church. We acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead. Let us pray for the church, for the world, and for all people according to our needs. Dear God, we are so slow to see others as your beloved children. Thank you for all the Canaanite women, men, and children in our world. Soften our hearts to lead people different from ourselves into Jesus' presence. Help us to discover that in his embrace, we truly become sisters and brothers to him and to each other. Lord, in your mercy, fashion your church into your holy house of prayer upon the earth. By your Holy Spirit, show us how to rightly welcome all people into its midst. Through your word and holy sacraments, draw many close to your beloved Son to hear, to pray for, and to receive his promised mercy, forgiveness, healing, and salvation. Lord, in your mercy, O oh God of Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Jacob, we pray for our brothers and sisters in the Jewish faith. Grant to them lively faith in you, fervent love for others, and joyful obedience to your holy law. Let us, together with them, see the fruition of your promised mercy, which is entrusted to Abraham and his family and shown by Jesus of Nazareth. Lord, in your mercy, <clears throat> forgive and heal division and warfare that make impossible even the most basic hospitality, justice, or safety for many of your people. Teach our rulers to seek the cooperation and kindness. Teach our rulers to seek the health, safety, and prospering of everyone entrusted into their care. Increase concord cooperation 
and kindness between those of different backgrounds or beliefs and teach everyone to look beyond those things which divide and to cling to your holy and merciful will to heal, redeem, and save all who receive you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, as schools approach opening day in a world clouded by pandemic and upheaval, we pray for students and teachers, parents and aides. Keep them safe and help them flourish. Bless their parents as they balance school life, home life, work life, and health. Lord, in your mercy, We remember that Jesus said, be encouraged. I am with you. Don't be afraid. We pray today for Downs the Fourth, Holden, Heidi and Cynthia. We pray for healing and recovery for Carlos, Virginia, Pearl, Susan, Tom, and Mary. We pray for those going through cancer treatments, especially John, Victoria, Andres, and Ginny. We pray for all who are under the care of skilled nursing, especially Mike, Bob, Ruth, Timothy, Don, and Barbara. We pray for all who are in hospice care, especially Ward. Save them from every affliction that threatens to undo them. Lead them to a place of safety, shelter, healing, and hope. And bless everyone who is entrusted with caring for them in any way. Lord, in your mercy. Thank you, dear God. Your fullest healing has been granted to all who died, trusting in your promised mercy. And so we commend them into your care, especially those that we now name. Grant us and everyone redeemed by the merits of Jesus the unmatched joy of life in your house, not as dogs under the table, nor as strangers or as guests, but as your children at home with you forever. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer, O Father, and grant all that glorifies you and builds up your people. This we ask for Jesus' sake. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen.
So for greetings and announcements, hello, welcome, greetings, great to see all of you. Uh, we have uh, two children who are heading off to school on Wednesday. We have more than just two, but we have two in, in God's house today that are doing that, so I'll invite them up here in a moment for a prayer. Uh, and I'm looking for any announcements. Uh, the first one is we have um, a almost full food barrel, so I'm very uh, happy to see that it's being filled because the need for food in our community is real. So thank you for uh, participating and helping in all of that. Uh, also, we have another announcement, and that is that um, the artists that we have in residence, the, uh, the art work that we have, will be up through Labor Day. Did I get? It's funny, I looked over here where you normally sit. <laughs> so, yes, <laughs> she moved. So, uh, through Labor Day? Yep, okay, good. Uh, and the art has been very popular, and uh, we are still selling it. I will miss it because it has a mirror, and then I make sure my stole is correct before I come in. So uh, we have that going, and, and Carol, thank you for your ministry in doing that. I'm looking forward to what our next artist will be in September. Are there any other announcements for the good of the cause? River Maggie? I was thinking about stoles, and I forgot about announcements. I um, want to remind all of us that part of our responsibility as the community of God is our, well, our community. So please, if you have not voted by absentee ballot in your local election, vote on Tuesday. Um, it's really an important right that we have and that makes it an important responsibility that we have. Thank you. All right. Any other announcements? Are there any birthdays or anniversaries this week? Ginger. So Ginger's at our 745 service. She is our elector. And so um, do you want to reenact that? Or how would you like to? Should I pretend as if I don't know? Okay, good. Her birthday's on Friday, so yeah. excellent. So happy birthday. Thank you. Father and David. the blessing that we gave uh, at 745, may God continue to bless you all the days of your life. Amen. Thank you. Well, thank you. Last Friday or next Friday? It is coming up this Friday, this Friday. And thank she's you. taking the day off, which is great. Good. And I think she's going to call her parents, which is Good. Even greater, because they're nice <laughs> Even greater, because they are nice people, absolutely. Very good. All right, Ethan and Elijah, if you can come forward. So um, I uh, was talking to Elijah the other day about what the word ambiguity means, and uh, I defined it to him as walking to a room that is dark. You know that there's a, a table, and you know there's a chair. You're not sure where it is. Uh, but that's ambiguity, and that is um, what he is doing in fifth grade. Uh, on Friday, we met with his homeroom teacher. He saw where his desk is, but he will be starting the school online, and we don't know when he will be uh, at that desk. We don't know when all the students will be back. Um, so it's, uh, it's ambiguous, and you are learning to do well with ambiguity. So that is, that's wonderful. Uh, Ethan is starting his senior year. And they're both going to Bradenton Christian School. And Ethan's senior year is not starting the way we would ever imagine it to start. We hope that it finishes the way that we hope it will finish, and that is with the prom and with the graduation. Uh, we'll see. Welcome to the world of ambiguity. So um, he has a rather challenging schedule this year, and he also is a leader in his band. Um, and we don't know what that looks like either. So. But, but here we are. So, uh, because you're in my bubble, we can all hold hands. So let's hold hands and let's pray. Loving God, I ask that you watch over these, your two servants, as they head to school. I ask that you protect them and guide them and um, work through them. And Lord, their school is also in our house. <laughs> so I ask that you bless Christy and me to be the best parents we can be, to be patient and loving. And Lord, we pray for all students as they are heading into school this year. And we ask that you watch over all of them and keep them all safe. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. 
All right, for Holy Communion, for those that have not participated in communion in our new era, um, we are uh, using wafers only, not wine. I do have wine, but uh, we're not consuming it today. Um, we do believe that uh, the Spirit of Christ cannot be divided. And so uh, with the Spirit of Christ uh, alive and well in the bread, it is also alive and well in the wine, which means we can receive one or the other and receive uh, the full spiritual uh, aspect of communion. So uh, today we'll be receiving bread only. We'll be receiving it outside where it is uh, relatively safe for us to take off uh, masks and to consume. So if you wanted to receive communion, first, anybody who's baptized in any Christian tradition, you are welcome to receive. And so once the service is over, Dale will play us out and I will start processing. And then uh, Pat and Anne, if you two could follow, and then the Urkers and the Judds, if you start to follow me out, I will go through the right-hand door, and I'll be waiting down by the font. And anybody who would like to receive communion, uh, go through the right door. If you would rather receive communion in its spiritual form without receiving its physical form, uh, you're invited to exit out through the left door. So I think that's it. Dale? Dale? The Lord be with you. Also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. For you are the source of light and life. You made us in your image and called us to new life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name.
Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people, the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And that the last day bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Together, let us pray. Grant, we beseech thee, almighty God, that through thy grace, the words which we have heard this day may be grafted inwardly in our hearts and bring forth in us the fruit of good living and the gifts of your kingdom. To the honor and praise of thy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and the love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord and the blessings of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you this day and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.